it's great to be here. Um, I'm a Mississippian by birth, lived here all my life, and it been in Jackson almost 40 years, and it's, it's really great to see the community to come together to do something like this. And I'd like the audience to give yourself a round of applause. I think that that's particularly important. <clears throat> I, I want to stretch your mind a little bit this afternoon and talk to you about some things I've been thinking about. I've been reflecting on uh, reconsidering the scientific method uh, in the context of the information age and based upon some work I've done over the last 25 years. And it's all about knowledge. In fact, acquisition of knowledge is what science is all about. The word science itself comes from the Latin scientia, which means knowledge. And the process for this knowledge acquisition is the scientific method. You know, you remember from elementary school, observation, make a hypothesis, test the hypothesis, reach a conclusion. And the derivative that we do in medicine, of course, is history and physical examination, differential diagnosis, testing, and final diagnosis or conclusion. But the important thing to remember is the currency of transaction for this knowledge acquisition is information. So it's easy to believe that our newfound abilities to manipulate information with computers and other technologies would have a profound effect on the practice of science and the scientific method. Now, the scientific method since its inception with Aristotle has had a tremendous evolution. Always balancing the inductive and deductive processes where induction is really the gathering of evidential experiences to create patterns and generalizations. And deduction is, by contrast, the top-down approach, starting with generalizations and moving towards a prediction or deduction of specific outcomes. But the central core concept that bridges these two lines of reasoning is the notion of theory where theory is a description of these generalizations based upon our observations. But theory is really much more than that. Theory is our conceptualization of how nature operates. It's our understanding and our working knowledge of the world. So theory is not simply a regurgitation of experiences, but it tells us the how the mechanisms by which things function. And this is what really gives science its power, its predictive power, which has made it a major driving force in our society today. Now, Aristotle understood deduction and induction very well, but he focused rather on developing theories based upon what he assumed causal structures that he thought was inherent in objects. More of the why, teleological approach. And that sat well with the ancient Greek philosophers who really weren't interested in the objectivity of their conclusions anyway. Because they had no way to measure things. They didn't have the tools and instruments to which to really analyze nature. And even if they did, they didn't have a robust mathematics to create the generalizations that would be theory. And this way of scientific thinking lasted for thousands of years through the Dark Ages and into the Renaissance until we reached a time where our first modern scientists, Galileo and Newton, began to take mathematical descriptions of basic physical events as they observed using instruments such as timepieces and telescopes to bring in a new understanding, and this is really the first modern scientific theory. And it was important because it, at last science was able to help us improve the lives of individuals. 
And it also became the link between the craftsmen and artisan that used tools and instruments on a daily basis in their work with the upper class intelligentsia who thought all knowledge came from deduction in thinking about that. So that was particularly important when you thought about finally we could break through the appearance of the world with these inductive instruments and see behind the scenes at the inner workings, the mechanisms involved, and understand the how, which really was our power in science. Now, while all these things were happening, we saw a number of tools available and developed that really drove our world. The optical lens instilled in telescopes and microscopes really drove the science that was there. So almost every paradigm shifting scientific theory was accompanied by a contemporaneous development of technology that drove it. It was the telescope that drove the heliocentric theory of Copernicus. It was the microscope that helped Cook develop his cell theory of biology. And both of these, of course, were important in the development of Newtonian mechanics and our early understanding of the nature of light. Really, it's astonishing to imagine that the simple creation of a craftsman, the optical lens, would have such an astounding impact on our understanding of the world. And other examples, of course, the steam engine drove the theory of thermodynamics. The generator we used by Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell to formulate electromagnetic theory. In 1881, Michelson's use of an interferometer to study light was the inspiration for the special theory of relativity. And at the beginning of the 20th century, the cathode ray tube allowed us for the first time to glimpse inside the atom. And that led to the development of modern quantum mechanics, nuclear physics, nuclear energy, and the atomic bomb. Now while all these emerging technologies were driving science, there was another method of science that's important for us today in thinking about information that was being fashioned in the mind of a lowly patent office clerk in Bern, Switzerland by the name of Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein couldn't wait for the development of technologies to understand the parts of the universe he was interested in. Most of them were unmeasurable anyway. I mean, after all, who could really ride on a beam of light? So he devised what we've come to know as the thought experiment, in which he created in his mind a simulation of an experiment that he used to inform the development of his theories, such as general relativity. But these experimental imaginings are, are quite complex, and we're not all Einsteins. In 1946, ENIAC became the world's first electronic computer that allowed us, for the first time, to analyze things in a much more complex way. These computers enabled us to create thought experiments, complex theories, that were far beyond the capacity of the human mind, even Einstein's, and allowed us to use geometries and algebras that were beyond the limited scope of those used by Newton in developing an idea of the solar system. So these computers became dream machines to create simulations, to create new worlds that we could only imagine and take us to places that were unknowable, like the beginning of the universe and the Big Bang and the beginning of time and deduction flourished, and we were able to do deduction in ways that previously were unimaginable. 
And induction also flourished. Because now we could take big data and the computer could sift and sort and now create patterns and relationships and associations that we couldn't see otherwise. And causality flourished. Because within these computers were the algorithms that showed us the specific causes and effects that allowed us to understand the mechanism, again, the how of why these observations were the way they were. So as we think about this, what does this mean for biology and medicine? Now, biology is vastly more complex than the physical sciences has ever thought about being. They're inherently dynamic, nonlinear, and integrated. How can we possibly, considering the internal workings of the cell, coherently devise an understanding of this without something that can capture all of that integration at one time, keep track of all the tracks and interactions inter that are occurring. So we began to think, could computers do for the biology what we know it's done for the physical sciences and make a significant difference? So we had a number of experimental models that we've used in biology for a number of years. Many of them you're familiar with, the in vivo, in vitro. Over the last 10, 15 years, we've developed what's called the in silico approach, which means on the computer, through simulation studies, a new way of thinking about biology. In the late 1960s, when computers were still in their infancy. My mentors, Dr. Arthur Guyton and Dr. Thomas Coleman at the University of Mississippi Medical Center began to develop computer models to simulate physiological systems and use them to inform their concepts and as an adjunct to the scientific method in conjunction with their experimentation. This early model of the circulation contains about 400 variables describing the interactions and interrelationships of a number of components within the human circulation. In 2014, our models now contains almost 7,000 equations containing not just the circulation, but respiratory system and nervous system and many other systems that allows us an integration and understanding. And with these models, we can make predictions and hypotheses about science of biology that we never could before. A really new approach to the scientific method in that regard. And our model has been an integral part of the NASA Digital Astronaut Project. And with it, we've been able to explore the impact of long-term microgravity on the human physiology. And this is an important question. Our limitation to get to Mars is not technological. We already have gone there. It's the limitations of human physiology. Can humans really get there? Can they survive it? And these kind of models can help inform us because there's no experimental platform on Earth to do this. Most recently, NASA has asked us to look at an understanding of why we see a change in remodeling of the heart of astronauts that have been on the International Space Station for six months or more. So we created a computer model. And the green shows the typical elongated, ellipsoid shape of the left ventricle. And when exposed theoretically to microgravity, it shifts its conformation to the red form that you see, forming our hypothesis, which we validated in both echocardiograms in space flight and, and in parabolic flights that simulate Moon and Earth and, of course, Mars' gravity. Now we began to have a platform where we can ask the how. What are the mechanisms responsible for that? 
In a more down-to-earth approach, our simulations helped inform the French Olympic team about what were the characteristics of the optimal sprinter and inform their training techniques. But probably more salient than that is the experiments that we do on computer to inform us in how we can practically affect the health and lives of you and me. One analysis that we did was an analyzing the common practice of laying a pregnant woman on her side to improve her circulation. The American Trauma Life Support Guidelines suggest a 15 to 30 degree tilt during trauma resuscitation. This is standard practice, but there's no evidence to support this recommendation. And there's not ethically any way we can test this idea. And traumatized pregnant women after a car wreck? But in silico, we can test this, and we found that it requires 50 to 60 degrees of tilt to normalize the circulation. The FDA has gotten interested in these kinds of analyses, and recently has come up with some guidance to suggest that we start testing our new drugs and therapies and devices in silico before we ever allow them to proceed to clinical trials. Extremely important in thinking about this moving forward. But what about the individual in front of you, the patient in the ICU? Can we do a systems analysis and understand all that data that we're getting from the monitors? Most of us have taken our car to a shop and the mechanic hooks our engine up to a computer and runs a diagnostic. Why can't we do the same for humans and run diagnostics and see what are the potential pathologies that are there? In this way, we let our computer and our simulations become the new stethoscope, the new microscope, the new black bag for the physician to allow the form a plan for our patients. Imagine a new way of doing science and medicine at the time of the information age. Thank you.